Uh, so yeah, so welcome everyone um, out there on Zoom, YouTube, here in person. We're super excited to have Justin Duncan um, uh, joining us all the way from uh, East Texas today. So he is a sustainable agriculture specialist with NCAT, which stands for the National Center of, for Appropriate Technology in their Southwest Regional Office. And I had the pleasure of seeing him present at the TOFCA conference, um, uh, which stands for Texas Organic uh, Farmers and Gardeners Alliance. So if you don't know about that organization, it's a little bit newer uh, association. Uh, they've been around since the 90s, not quite as old as uh, Austin Organic Gardeners, but um, it's a great organization as well. Definitely check them out. They have a lot of great education around organic and sustainable practices. But um, yeah, so we're super excited to have him. So let's give him a warm welcome. All right, um, yeah, so uh, my organization does a lot of research and extension type activities. And so we had a uh, conservation innovation grant uh, awarded to us by the uh, NRCS, which is a Nat Natural Resource Conservation Service, which used to be the Soil Conservation Service back in the 30s and all that sort of stuff. Y'all remember that from history, Dust Bowl era? Yeah, all right, so. Um, they gave us money to figure out uh, the cover crops that do well in the hot, humid, uh, semi-arid type places in Texas, because their information was incomplete on that subject. So um, the NRCS is, you know, has recommended lists for all, all the rest of the country, but, you know, places like South Texas, or uh, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, those places that are uh, you know, subtropical, they just didn't have good knowledge. So they, they charged us with the, uh, with the task of figuring out what grows well in those areas. And a lot of those things um, perform well in the rest of Texas, well, in the hotter, uh, hotter areas of Texas too. So um, if y'all know anything about growing down in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, they get about 20 to 25 inches of rainfall a year. What are y'all out here in, in uh, Travis County? About 32. All right, so in the Houston area, we get about 40, 44, or normally 40 to 44 inches of rain uh, a year. So growing down in the valley was a little bit uh, challenging for me because uh, if my, my background is in plant breeding, specifically mutation breeding. And one of my bad habits or good habits, depending on how you look at it, uh, that I carried over from uh, mutational breeding is if I'm going to look at, um, you know, my first selection of crops, I want the toughest selection criteria possible. So I'm going to put it out there and let it grow and not take care of it. And whatever survives and gives me seed, cool, I'll work with that. If it doesn't survive and give me seeds, I'm not even going to worry about it because Texas I don't know if y'all know this, but Texas is a bit of a harsh growing environment. Um, you know, I meet people from like the Northeast and, and, you know, like safe gardening places like that. And they tell me that they weed once a season. And I just look at them because I don't know if it's with, with anger or envy or what, but, you know, we have to weed every four days and they can get away with weeding once a season. I was very upset, you know, when, when the young lady told me that. However, uh, Texas heat and challenging soil conditions uh, can make great spaces for weeds to grow, but not so great for places for our crops to grow. So um, yeah, I wanted to go figure out you know, what, what grew, what didn't, and this is the result of, of that study. Um, All right, so this, this soil familiar to y'all, this situation? All right, so our crops don't like this because it's hard for them to, to grow. It's hard for them to function like normal plants in this condition. What causes this? 
clay, but what about the clay? Lack of cultivation. There's there's something missing in this soil that's making it like this. Water. Oh, somebody said it. Organic matter. No organic matter in the soil. You know what it tested out at? Less than half a percent of organic matter. So why do we need organic matter? Because if you don't have organic matter, then the soil cannot act as a sponge and hold water. So the organic matter is, is the first priority that I look at. Water is next because without the, without the organic matter, then you can't hold the water. It's, it's going to sheet run off or it's going to go away some kind of way. So we need the organic matter. So this soil didn't have it. And so we were trying to figure out which cover crops we could grow. And in East Texas, in, in Prairie View and Waller County, Crimson Clover does absolutely fantastic for me. So I was growing Crimson Clover uh, over there at Prairie View uh, at the university there, my, my alma mater, and it did great. I tried to grow it in South Texas and not so much. So again, we, we've got a, lack, a total lack of organic matter. Um, the roots of whatever plant is growing cannot extend beyond these cracks. Have y'all heard of uh, air pruning? Some people. No, air pruning. Yeah. Air yeah. pruning. Somebody said, yeah. All right, good, good deal. So, all right, with air pruning, that is a suspended raised bed above the soil. When, when the roots grow down to the bottom, which is like a screen, they self prune. That is exactly the same thing that's happening in these little cracks. The root gets to that edge or near the edge and it can't grow beyond that edge. So you don't want air pruning to happen in your vegetables because you're not gonna get accumulation of vegetative matter. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some different, different reasons why we use cover crops, what I do. Oh, I didn't want to be seen anywhere. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about some different reasons and ways that we use cover crops. And one is, uh, is trap cropping. Trap cropping is the use of a cover crop or some other, uh, other crop um, grown in, uh, in conjunction with your main crop or your cash crop. This, this graphic is not to scale you would not have this much crop, uh, trap crop growing in between your, your, uh, your crops. You only need about one eighth of your entire area to be put into the, uh, into the trap crop. This one is multiple trap cropping and you have three different types of uh, trap crop or you have three different physiological states of the trap crop. In this case, I'm thinking about cotton because you would grow, <coughs> excuse me, you would grow alfalfa with cotton to attract pests away from the cotton. And then you mow the uh, alfalfa at different times. And I'm getting the business again. I'm just gonna change some things on here to where. Oh, wait. I don't, I don't wanna see my face. Please hold for these technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, I think it should just show you on this one, but I don't know why. I'll, I'll highlight you when I get back to my, and then we're gonna hide these, which I don't know how to get rid of. I don't know. I don't know where. Maybe, maybe clicking on the presentation again? No, because it says set up before the yeah, audio. I close that. I don't see like an X or anything. Maybe hide floating meeting controls. There we go. All right. All right. So in any case, uh, this this example is looking at um, looking at alfalfa, and it's mowed at different times to keep it in a young physiological state to keep the pests away from the cotton. All right, so then we've got push-pull trap cropping. And uh, this is a use of a 
push crop, which is something that repels a pest that's grown amongst the main crop and a trap crop surrounding the perimeter. So the push crop pushes the pests away from your main crop and the, the pests are attracted to the trap crop on the perimeter. And then you can control the pest by whatever means you want in that trap crop. Um, this was, as far as I know, this was originated in uh, Eastern Africa. And when they figured out that they could use, um, they could use Desmodium in with their, uh, with their corn, they could uh, increase their productivity of their corn, their corn crop. And once, uh, once they figured that out, it spread to, you know, tens of thousands of farmers within a few months. All right, so this is one of my favorite um, uh, combinations, which is the use of cover crops. I mean, use of uh, crimson clover with, uh, with broccoli. So I figured out at Prairie View that if I would plant a field in crimson clover and let it go to seed and then mow it, uh, then grow whatever crop I was gonna grow over the summer um, and then come back in the fall and shape the field up and get it, get it where I wanted it, once the clover seeds started germinating, I would transplant the, uh, the broccoli plants into it. And so the broccoli would, you know, it's a transplant, not a seedling. So it's going to grow a lot faster than the uh, clover crop. And so once you're finished harvesting your broccoli, uh, the clover fills in the field. And so now you've got the, uh, the cover crop displacing your cash crop and you know, doing all the great benefits that the uh, that the uh, cover crop imparts, like um, being a host site for beneficial uh, insects, um, slowing down uh, rain uh, rain raindrop uh, infiltration, and all all that sort of stuff. So every year, this would this would be like a, a replicating cycle because the clover would start germinating and I would know to transplant the broccoli. So there was like a, on a yearly cycle. All right, a more important concept of cover crops is, is you know, what they, what they do for soil health. So on the right, on the left, I guess, on the, on the shaded side, um, if your soil is, is shaded by the canopy of the cover crop, you give time for the debris or the leaves that fall to build up. When those leaves build up, they, where's, where's uh, Angel at? This, uh, this is like your favorite slide so far, right? Because I'm talking about the mycelium and the humus and all that. Yeah, I see that. All right, so um, the, the debris builds up and it shades the soil, it holds soil moisture, and it allows the fungal hypha to build up and that allows for the, the uh, creation of humus or the labile organic matter in the soil. Uh, in, in an exposed situation, you have the opposite. You, your soil can't hold the amount of moisture and then you have this situation develop because the soil is uncovered. Uh, there's very little fungal hypho running around in the soil uh, in, these, in these exposed situations because the sun is cooking it. Um, then your organic matter, it just burns up. Um, so, of course, if you have those three uh, negatives, then your temperature is going to be higher. So your ambient temperature is higher. And so that becomes a self-replicating cycle because the higher the temperature, the less able your soil is to build up uh, organic matter and uh, feed the fungal hypha and, uh, and hold on to the soil moisture and all that. All right, so in cooler areas, we have, uh, we have, more, soil, uh, we have more soil organic matter. And um, that organic matter is more sensitive to loss at higher temperatures. So in a cool area, if the average temperature rises only one degree, well, Celsius, um, you expect to lose 10% of your labile organic matter. Labile organic matter is the soft stuff, the, the humus and all that, because there's, a, there's other organic matter, but it's like the sticks. It's the hard things. It's the, it's the stuff that really doesn't contribute so much to soil, uh, soil health. 
in a warm area, that same, same rise of one degree would only result in about a 3% loss of soil organic matter. Why is that? Because in these hotter areas, we have poor quality soil organic matter to begin with. So of course, if the, if the temperature rises and you've got poor quality soil organic matter, um, then you're not gonna lose that much because there wasn't, there, it wasn't that much in the beginning. Um, so soils, uh, soils are a sponge. Hopefully, if you've got a good amount of uh, organic matter, um, because you know, they hold a large reservoir of water in that organic matter. The hotter it becomes, uh, the more water is lost, but also the more organic matter is lost. The loss of organic matter leads to a loss of soil, wa soil water holding capacity. And that water holding capacity is like when it rains and the field drains out for a day, how much water is left in that field. Um, so the less water in the soil, the hotter ambient temperature become. It's basically a self-replicating cycle of heating, which I touched on earlier. All right, so how do how do, uh, how does soil organic matter decompose? Um, in hot and humid areas, we need twice the inputs of organic matter to main fertility. And that's not every year, that's every growing cycle because it, we burn up that much stuff. Um, in no-till situations, you, use, you lose half of, of the organic matter as conventional tillage. So using no-till, if everything remains the same in hot areas, it should equal out because you've got the losses from the heat and then you've got the losses from the tillage and, and, and all that. But if you take out the tillage and use no-till, you should use less. But the problem comes in vegetable production because how do you incorporate the organic matter if you don't till it? Yes, sir. You seed directly into your cover crop. That's one method, but there's there's another method that has existed as long as as there have been um, soil biota, and that's that's called bioturbation. As long as there's living creatures in the soil, what's some of your favorite living creatures in the soil? Earthworms. Earthworms. As long as they're there and doing their job, they come up to the surface, they feed, they come back down, and they just keep on cycling stuff up and down in the soil. Now, does do these uh, conventional ag fields have a bunch of earthworms in them? Because no. uh, they've nuked those soils to death. I'm not being recorded, am I? I'm not going to have like <laughs> corporate hitmen after me and stuff, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, soil organic matter disperses negative effects. Um, organic, matter, uh, organic molecules bind to toxic soil minerals. And you've got you've to think like the org our organic molecules are not small things. They're huge, huge long chain molecules. Um, so these things are able to sweep up toxic uh, minerals in the soil and kind of lock them in. Um, iron and manganese are usually toxic soil minerals. Um, they're reduced to less toxic levels by dispersion in humus. Uh, same thing with aluminum. Or organic acids disarm free aluminum in soil. Aluminum is highly toxic to plant roots. Aluminum is highly toxic to y'all too. So I'm not a doctor and I'm not here to treat, cure, or cure or diagnose any diseases, but if you've got aluminum pots, go throw that stuff away. All right, so um, composts. This is a point of contention for me because a lot of people believe in composting and I, I don't. I'm not a composter. Tim, are you, you, Tim, you compost? trench compost. See, okay, so better, better. All right. So in hot areas, it increases the volatilization of your nitrates and your carbon from your compost. <clears throat> Think about the composting process. It's an exothermic chemical reaction. It releases heat. If y'all walk outside, how does it feel out there right now? It's hot. So if you've got an exothermic reaction and you've got a bunch of heat, ambient temperature, a lot of ambient heat, and you add those together, what do you get? Extra hot. You start off with a big pile of organic matter at the beginning of the season, beginning of the composting cycle, and what are you left with at the end of that process? Less, a lot less. So where, where is that pile going? 
Remember conservation of mass? There's there's got to there's got to be a place for that stuff to go, and it's all volatilizing. It's all turning into carbon dioxide, turning into atmospheric nitrogen, nit nitric oxide, all the all the nitrogen compounds that are gases. I don't want that. So what do I do? I do deep mulching, or some people call it Ruth Stout, or whatever. I pile up a bunch of stuff and let it cold compost and break down on its own. All right, so uh, manure. Manure is another excellent thing that you can mix, mix in with the, uh, with the soil to build your soil organic matter. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, it's bulky and it's messy to move. It's really hard for me to get a tractor trailer load of horse manure from a farm that's 30 miles away from me because every guy, every time the guy is ready, it rains or his truck breaks down or something. And I'll, I just want the manure, please. Anyway, um, it's, it's hard to move. And then there are regulations if you are certified organic. Right, Tim? Do, do, well, do you use it? Some certifiers will allow manure. Yep. All right. So I pick on Tim because I know him. I, I don't know most of y'all. Well, have y'all been skipping out on the Tofka conference or what? <laughs> Anybody been to the Tofka conference? All right. A few of y'all. All right. Next year, I charge y'all to all go to the Tofka conference and enjoy yourselves. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so there's, there's uh, regulations when it comes to organic certification and the use of manure because um, on a lot of crops, there's, there's a withdrawal period. So you have to leave it. You, you can't harvest any of the crops that a manure, a manure is applied to within like 90 days or something like that. Um, so you just have to understand if you're gonna use manure, and you're certified organic, there's, there's some things that you have to deal with. But it is a good option to build so, soil organic matter. Okay, so cover crops, they, they grow your organic matter in place. There's no withdrawal period, and, it, and they can add nitrogen to your soil if you're using nitrogen fixers, um, like your, your legumes. Um, they move minerals from the subsoil into the topsoil, and they increase soil porosity. Um, and you've got some options with them. You can mow and incorporate, you can mow and mulch, or you can use no-till systems. All right, so this is from our experiment down there in the valley. And these are different, uh, different rows of cover crops uh, planted out. And the blank spots are control um, plots. And the little circles are where they had uh, soil moisture meters. I see the little circles? Uh, excuse me, can we ask questions as you go or do you want to wait till the end? Uh, you can ask questions. Could you back up a slide then? Okay. What's the difference between mow incorporate and mow and mulch and no-till? What's the difference between those three? All methods? right, so when you mow, mow and incorporate, you mow your cover crop and then you take a, a big machine like a, like my favorite is a reciprocating spader. Um, some people use tillers, but I don't recommend tillers. Don't, don't use tillers. Um, and you, you turn the soil over on top of the cover crop and the cover crop residue breaks down underground. Uh, mowing and mulching is, is just that. You mow it and you leave the residue on top of the soil and then no-till. Um, so there's this machine or tractor, tractor implement called a roller crimper. And in mythical places like the North, um, when you roll over a field of a cover crop with this roller crimper, it kills the cover crop. Yeah, uh, that doesn't work for me here in Texas because our crops are a little bit tougher than that stuff out there. And so uh, when they use a the roller crimper, it rolls over the cover crop, lays it flat and crushes it up and, and all that. And then you come back through with a, uh, with a no-till seeder, no-till grain drill or, or planter or whichever, and you seed directly into that. And incorporate kind of like a double big rework with these machines. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Oh, she was asking, was mowing and in, mowing incorporating um no mowing, yeah, mowing in it and incorporating like double digging. And I've got a I've got a friend named Lavelle Merritt. 
He used to come in, uh, and, and work with me at, at Prairie View's farm. I had all the machines out there that you could ever want, like the best soil management machines in Texas. And this guy would come out there with a spade and he would double dig the field. <laughs> Guy's work ethic is awesome though. He just got promoted to some new position in, in, uh, in, the, US, in, the, in the US government. So awesome guy. All right, so we monitored the moisture and here are our results. Um, of course, that big spike is a rain, rainfall event. And um, these results kind of mess with my mind because they're saying that the control plots actually had more soil moisture than the cover crop plots. All right, so different cover crops, different cover crop uh, combinations. Uh, and this is at Hilltop Gardens. Um, and this is looking at organic matter in the soil. Um, so of uh, they're over different time periods. All right, so how do you choose your cover crops? Is anyone growing cover crops now? Few people, what are you growing? Sunflowers too. Okay. What are you growing? Um, I'm just cutting back my oats now, and the um, got a lot of powdery mildew on the uh, just Austrian winter peas. Mm. But about to put in buckwheat and uh, southern peas. Okay. And you? Put in millet, but I don't know if it's So, all right. Okay. All right. So, you're heavy on the grasses. So why, why is that? Because you want the organic matter, huh? That 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 veg that mass. I started doing it when I had a really you know, dry crack like that, and started doing it, and all this moisture came into the yard. And so when the grasses are no longer moisture, they're We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So I'm I'm heavy on the legumes. I really don't like the grasses, and it's because sometimes they're too efficient at their job. They're nitrogen scavengers. And if I, I'm, I'm out in Eastern Texas and so my soils are very poor in nitrogen. So I'm, I'm heavy on legumes because I'm trying to build up the, the nitrogen and the, uh, and the organic matter. But the, the grasses perform very, very well here. Okay. All right, so you're heavy on legumes, which I, which I like to see. And you have powdery mildew, so get with me on uh, later after this and we can talk about the powdery mildew and, and how you can fix it with some mad science stuff. <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, you've, got to, you've got to consider your soil. Um, out here, y'all have alkaline soils for the most part, calcareous soils. Oh, uh, yeah, just awful. Uh, caliche? caliche, you dig down deep and there's a white layer. I don't envy y'all at all. <laughs> all right, so uh, so y'all uh, pH is about seven point eight to eight point two. Mm. Scary. All right, so what's your soil texture? Um, is it sandy? Is it is it a silty? Is it clay? Uh, is it droughty? Uh, do you have floods that you're dealing with? Or do you have soil borne diseases? Um, all that sort of thing. You're the growing seasons and cycles. What I was showing you with the broccoli and the clover. That that seasonality, those those growing cycles, um, understand what they are, uh, how and how you can interrupt um, pest cycles or disease cycles with your cover crops. Uh, what's the next crop? Are you are you growing a cover crop that is potentially allelopathic? Yeah, are you familiar with allelopathy? Have y'all ever seen? Um, have y'all ever seen when when uh when the peanuts go to France? Y'all never seen Charlie Brown? They went to France. Yeah. So in 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 that epic, <laughs> yeah, the the peanuts kid, Charlie Brown and them, they went to France, and there was a chateau called Le Le Voisin Mal, which is a bad neighbor, 
allelopathic chemicals are when plants are are bad neighbors. They don't like their they don't like their neighbors, and so they emit chemicals into the soil that suppress the growth of their neighbors. A good example is um, oleander. You ever see anything grow under oleander? You know why? Because those leaves are poisonous as hell, and when they drop, they kill everything underneath them. Same case with uh, with black walnuts. Um, they don't like stuff growing under them. Pine, uh, oak, their leaves are highly acidic, so they uh, they acidify the soil surface and they wipe out a lot of their competition. Cover crops have that same potentiality, so you have to be aware if your cover crop has that potential. Uh, what are your equipment uh, requirements? Do you need haying equipment? Can you afford haying equipment if you're managing vegetables? It's a whole other ball game. And then weed control. What weeds are you trying to control? Um, what seasons are they growing in? When are they active? And, and all that. I, I love it for weed control. That's my main purpose for, for using cover crops be, beyond the, uh, beyond the soil, soil health benefits. All right, so most of these are legumes because like I said, I don't like grasses. Uh, they're handy facts and they're no means uh, comprehensive. I have a publication that I wrote for this, uh, this, uh, this pro um, project called the same name as the, the presentation, Cover Crop Options for Hot and Humid Areas. If you look on the ATRA website, and let me, let me go back. Are y'all familiar, uh, familiar with NCAT and ATRA? One person, a few people. All right, so we're the National, uh, National Center for Appropriate Technology. And we were born of the 70s and farm energy crisis and farm aid and Willie Nelson in those days. Um, we've got a program called ATRA. And it is basically teaching farmers, producers how to use less um, chemical intensive or synthetic chem uh, synthetic chemical intensive use of, uh, of you know, like pesticides in, in your management and all that. So I'm basically an organic crop consultant. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, our website, atra, atra.ncat.org has hundreds of publications on all sorts of uh, sustainable agriculture uh, uh, topics. And yeah, I've got some stuff written in there along with um, a lot of my colleagues who've written some amazing things. All right, so uh, legumes need to be inoculated with the proper rhizobium for them to be able to fix nitrogen. If you put, if you put P inoculum on a clover, the inoculum or the rhizobium is going to grow on the roots of the, uh, of the clover, but now it's not fixing nitrogen, it's acting as a disease. Because back in the day, before there was all the differentiation and all this, the rhizobium was, was a root disease. It forms nodules on plant roots and forces the plant to feed it carbohydrates and it just kind of feeds off the plant and grows. So legumes got smart and said, hey, little bacteria, you're riding on me. Give me something. Give me something in exchange. And so the bacteria is like, okay, I'll give you a little nitrogen. Legumes like, cool. So they formed a partnership. So now these rhizobium, they will form nodules on the wrong legume, but they won't feed that legume. The way, the way that you tell is if you you pull up a plant or dig under there and find a nodule and break open the nodule and look inside of it. If it's pink or salmon colored or like, like, like a reddish hue, it's working on most rhizobium species. Um, and the rhizobium forms a, a, a thing that's similar to hemoglobin. That's what gives it the red color. Anyway, some of the rhizobium, they persist in the soils better than others, like the one for the mesquite trees is the same one for like uh, cassia and or chemicrista and uh, the cowpeas, uh, peanuts, that sort of thing. They all like that same uh, rhizobium. And it persists in the soil. You don't need to apply it every year and all that sort of thing. Others, um, 
they're more ephemeral, they'll burn off and you've got to reapply them every planting. Um, and it depends on the, the soil and all that. Is the soil conducive to growing the rhizobium or is it not? If uh, you know what the rhizobium feeds on if there's no plant present, organic matter. If you've got high, high amounts of organic matter in your soil, the rhizobium can persist a little bit better. All right, so arrakis. And I'm sad to say that even though we had this on our list, we didn't get a, get a chance to try this one out for this project. I've got, a, I've got two more cover crop uh, projects that got funded and I'll try, they'll, uh, try the arrakis out with, uh, with those projects. But this is the perennial peanut. Um, it's a prostrate and creeping plant propagated by uh, rhizomes and is inoculant is usually included in the plugs. People buy plugs for this just like you would buy plugs for Bermuda grass. Um, it's somewhat uh, showy yellow flowers. You, you can use it as an ornamental. Uh, it fixes about 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is what the plant looks like. The peanuts, I wouldn't eat these because they're rare. And if you can get seed off of them, they'd probably be pretty expensive, so don't eat them. <laughs> Growing in a field situation, uh, this is it being used in between sago palm. And the application of this is I wanted producers to grow it in citrus groves because then you don't have to mow or spray for you know weeds and stuff because it only gets four inches tall. And it, fix, and it fixes nitrogen and it keeps runoff from happening. So, I, and, and you can walk on it. Yeah, I mean, don't stomp a mud hole in it, but yeah, you can, you can tread on it a little bit. It's not gonna fly a flag with a snake on it. All right, so um, y'all didn't get the don't tread on me. Y'all gotta be quicker, Austin, come on. Quicker, quicker. One person got it, all right, anyway. Um, yeah, don't tread on me. All right, so uh, Cassia rotundifolia or Chemicrista rotundifolia, Chemicrista fasciculata. Uh, these can be toxic to cattle in later stages of development. They use the same uh, cowpea or peanut inoculant. It's a Texas native and it's a bee crop. If y'all, any beekeepers in here? Any beekeepers in here? One, two, all right, cool. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a um, it's a, a great crop for uh, for bees because it's flowering during the dearth, um, and it can produce about 560 pounds per acre. It's also known as partridge pea. I don't like using common names because people come up with all sorts of crazy common names and none of them are right. But partridge pea is also known as uh, chemicrista. So you can see chem uh, cassia uh, fasciculata or chemicrista rotundifolia or chemicrista uh, fasciculata, just depending on whoever wrote the, the literature. Uh, could I ask you a question? Sure. So you're talking a lot about inoculants and apparently there are different kinds of inoculants. Right. What is an inoculant and where do you get it? Uh, you get your inoculants from the feed store. The inoculant is, is, the, the, uh, is the rhizobium itself. It's the bacteria that you mix with your seed before planting. Yeah, she's saying Callahan's usually has uh, inoculant. Now, look at your inoculant and make sure that the expir expiration date hasn't passed. And also make sure that you're not getting that garden mix. Don't get the garden mix. Get the specific rhizobium for whatever crop you're looking for. And does the, the, like, will the package of inoculant say what cover crop it's yes. for? Yes, it, it'll say what, uh, what group of uh, legumes it inoculates. And then if you look up my publication, uh, Cover Crops for Hot and Humid are Areas on the ATRA uh, website, I have a table in the back as an appendix that breaks down all the different inoculants and what, uh, what crops that they uh, should go to. Thanks. All right, no problem. All right, so next is Faciolus uh, coccinius or scarlet runner beans. Any of y'all grown those? Had good luck with them? How'd they grow? Very well with sunflowers. Sunf well with sun That's what the research says. Now, did you water them? Yes. Only water once a week. Okay, so I didn't water mine because I was trying to. Yes, sir. Can you take the heat? 
If you water them, that would, that's the big thing. Because remember, I was trying to throw all the cover crop uh, cover crop um, uh, species into the crucible of Texas heat to see what came out of it. If it survived, I'm recommending it. If it didn't survive, mm, we'll move on to something else. But the scarlet runner beans did very well for me as long as the soil was moist. Once the summer heat really, really turned on, the scarlet runner beans turned off. But I did get some seed production, even though in different different accessions. And I have to, you know, send a shout out to the uh, Ag Research Service and their germ germplasm repository information service. They sent me seeds that I use for our research. And so the scarlet runner beans, some of them actually did, some accessions actually did make it through the summer and flowered and fruited. So um, they're worth looking at if, and especially in a garden situation, because you have the time, effort, and energy, and willpower to water them. I was growing in a field position, a field situation. I didn't, I didn't care to, to, you know, irrigate and all that. Um, very ornamental from Central America. Uh, their pods are edible, and then some people eat their roots as well. But some people say that the roots are toxic. And you have to understand that there's different land races. There are different land races of scarlet runner bean. So not all of the roots are edible. Some were, some were selected for edibility. Um, like Lab Lab or the hyacinth bean, their, uh, their young pods can be eaten. Don't eat the older pods unless you're going to cook them a lot and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, they use the same inoculant as the common bean because uh, the common bean is, is Faciolus vulgaris. This one's Faciolus coccineus. They are close, closely enough related where they can share uh, inoculants. Uh, their yields are better uh, monoculture than interplanted, but if you're going to intercrop them, use sunflowers. All right, and this is uh, what it looks like. It's just a big regular bean. It's just bigger. All right, Vigna radiata which is the mung bean. Um, they are a close relative to cow, uh, cowpeas. Cowpeas are Vigna ungaculata, Vigna, uh, Vigna radiata, Vigna ungaculata. It could be a poem or a song or something. Uh, they also benefit from arbuscular mycorrhiza in addition to rhizobium inoculation. Uh, they are a grain type legume and they're valued for human consumption. And, you know, we use them for bean sprouts. Um, some, cultivar, uh, some cultivars are, are erect, while the wild types are more prostrate. Prostrate farms are better suited for uh, cover crops. This is what they look like. And they're, they have a pretty strong vining habit if they're, uh, if they're more, more of the uh, wild type. Uh, next is Centrosoma molly or Centrosoma pu pubescens. We have uh, Centrosoma virginiana here in Texas, in East Texas. This is called the soft butterfly pea. And this is one that I don't recommend that y'all grow in like a field situation because it needs too much uh, irrigation. It can tolerate water logging, which is why I mentioned it um, with, the, with the rest of the cover crops and didn't take it out. It's good for uh, bank stabilization against like river banks or creek, uh, creek sides where there's a lot of uh, erosion. Coincidentally, that's why kudzu was brought to the United States. So this has that same ability, but it doesn't have that vegetable morass that kudzu has. Uh, it's useful as a green manure crop in uh, rubber and palm pla uh, plantations in Africa and Asia. And so basically a green, green manure crop is what you would grow uh, over your field and get that uh, that vegetative matter and then turn it under while it was at its peak uh, growing. Uh, as a fodder crop, if you're going to feed it to uh, livestock, it can make 20 tons of, uh, of fresh matter per, um, per, uh, per acre. This is what it looks like. And if you've ever been in the woods of East Texas, you'll have seen this little, this little flower. It has a
don't know what to call it. There's a word for it. I think it's corollary or something like that. It has something that fits the same niche in sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa and Asia, which is Clitoria turn uh, terniata. Uh, like Centrosema, it's inoculated on cowpea type uh, rhizobium. It's a beautiful ornamental and it yields about two tons per acre dry matter and more if it's fertilized, 15, acre, 15 pounds per acre is the optimal seeding rate. This is one of the most beautiful cover crops you could ever grow and it's medicinal. Uh, these are the flowers and people use it um, medicinally as a tea and it keeps that blue color when you make the tea. This one I recommend because it not only grew through Texas heat with no rain for six weeks and more than 100 degrees, um, it also flowered and fruited. So if you could get this, grow it, it's great. Would you try and change it with blue wheatgrass? Did I do what? No, I wasn't growing any grasses. Fire on grass. Destroy all grasses. Y'all ever seen Futurama? That robot bender, he says, yeah. destroy all humans. I'm destroy all human, uh, destroy all grasses. <laughs> Y'all humans can kind of make it. I can pre pretend to be an extrovert for a little while. But this is this is work for me. Anyway, um, yeah, so y'all get a pass. I'm not going to destroy all humans. <laughs> all right, so next is uh, Cotillaria juncia, or also known as sun hemp. It fixes about 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And when I say nitrogen, I don't mean like ni atmospheric nitrogen. I mean like nitrates. I'm not, you know, I'm just, I'm just being easy on y'all. I'm not, not using all the technical. Why do you think that? Because I grow vegetables. Okay. And I don't want grass except for lemongrass and sugarcane and maybe corn, but the rest of the grasses, like, what's that? It's not a, it's not truly a grass. No, not truly. I, I see where you're getting at, but it's, it's not, it's not truly a grass. Um, but uh, we've got this thing called Cynodon dactylon or Bermuda grass. It is the devil. It is the absolute plant devil. I, I because of that I hate grass. All right, so uh, yeah, sun him. Right, right. It's building building the nitrogen and organic matter content, and the grass is stealing all that stuff. Will you see in South Texas? Will you see Bermuda grass growing in lush areas? What about? Uh, Johnson grass. Johnson grass just uh, Johnson grass is just as bad. That and uh, the nuts edge. The nuts edge is not truly a grass either, but it, it's there and it's awful. Yes, ma'am. How is it in New York City that you grow? And I was sitting last night and I was behind you on the wall with this piece of really old art about the grass. And I looked at it, I looked it up, and it was. It, had, it, was, it was about it being sacred. And I thought, well, that sucks. Because I always hated the grass like you, you know? But then I realized that what the grass does is hold the dirt. It, it does. And, and, and that's really, really great in some areas that easily goes away in a way. Right, right. I think the grass would like, serve as like a tiny <laughs> <laughs> and and grass is grass is responsible for some some of the richest soils in the world, the mollusols. Um, grass has its purpose, just not in my vegetable plots, fields, or beds. <laughs> we we can fight about grasses later, but let, let's 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 finish this. <laughs> All right, so. Um, um, <laughs> I got me all off track. Uh, it produces about five tons of dry matter um, per acre, and then it attracts beneficial insects like trichogramma. Y'all familiar with trichogramma? Y'all have caterpillars? Okay, so trichogramma needs to be your best friend because trichogramma is a little wasp that lays its eggs inside of moth eggs, and their larva destroys those larvae. 
and they're awesome. So grow crotillaria and you can attract some trichogramma. Um, intercropping reduces uh, disease prevalence in squash because think about how squash grow and think about sun hemp grows. Sun hemp is erect, it's tall. Squash is like all over the place. So the, the powdery mildew inoculum blows in the wind or is rain splashed. And so if you've got a wall of protolaria that the spore of the uh, powdery mildew hits upon, it can't, the, the spore can't germinate on that, on that crotillary. So the spore is, is, is denatured. It, it's no good anymore. It's, it's not gonna become disease. So your squash plot is growing here and your next squash plot is over here. And so it, it prevents or slows down the spread of diseases because of the different architecture of the plants. Uh, Johnson grass or uh, Sudan grass, the uh, hay grazer, those crosses, Sudan, uh, Sudan, uh, sorghum, uh, sudum, ah, sorghum Sudan grass, um, they're also, they also have that tall erect uh, architecture to block uh, uh, your, your spores from blowing around in your, in your field if you wanna use grass with your vegetables. Yes, sir. Uh, how tall do you let the sun hip grow? Uh, sun hip can get six to eight feet, depending. Um, you can, I mean, it depends on, on your, on what you're looking for. Um, if you want seed production off the, off the sun hemp, um, some of them will seed up here. A lot of them won't seed, um, north of, of Corpus Christi. Uh, if you're just looking for the wind blockage, like a windbreak or whatever, you can, you could cut them off a little bit. But the taller they are, the better at breaking the wind and, and blocking the, uh, the disease movement around the field. So it depends on you. All right, so it's also inoculated with the cow pea group. So any of the, uh, any of the, the native uh, uh, hardy uh, uh, rhizobium will, will uh, inoculate the uh, crotillaria. And this is uh, some of it in the field. It's coming to flower. And this is the, on the, the, the white flowers, that's buckwheat. Um, so you see the, uh, the sun hemp on the other picture and there's some, um, there's some lab lab growing underneath it. It's just showing you the different architectures and how, you know, it, it can block stuff from spreading around the field. All right, so next is Desmodium uncinatum, and I outsource the growing of this to a good friend of mine, uh, John Riley, over at the uh, Texas Plant and Texas Plant Material Center in uh, in Kingsville. He grew this out, and it did pretty well for him. Um, it roots at the nodes. This is that thing that they grew in Africa along with their corn to stop a thing called striga or witch weed. We don't have that over here. We have something similar called uh, 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 daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R or what's the name? Cuscutum. And it's an orange weed that's parasitic and it, it scrambles all over your, your crops and sucks their, 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 uh, their vitality out of them. But uh, striga is like that in Africa. Uh, they grew Desmodium in the field, and it not only stopped the Striga, but it also stopped uh, insect pests from messing with their corn. It is, uh, you can grow it in, in, you know, places with a little bit of, a uh, little bit of flooding and higher water tables and, uh, and lower pH. It's not suitable for clay soils. It's not, it's not productive in dry periods, but it will survive. Um, if you apply molybdenum to it and most other legumes, it can help with your, uh, with your nodule, nodulation. So when the rhizobium uh, is in the soil, it needs molybdenum to infect the roots to make the nodule to produce the nitrogen. It's, uh, it's got a high co tannin content, so it's not as palatable for livestock, but once they do, if you add a little bit of it into their diet, it can, it can help any of y'all grow, uh, raise goats or sheep? A few people, 
Um, this can help control the barber pole worm or Hamuncus contortus. And that's what it looks like. All right, so lab lab or the hyacinth bean is a food crop in Asia and Africa. It's gaining popularity popularity in the United States as a deer attractant because it is a high protein legume that grows very quickly and the deer hunters put it out there in their pots to attract um, deer and, and make sure that their deer are, are ha happy and healthy. It's got very showy flowers and seed pods. The seed pods are purple um, and when they're purple and young they're edible. They're weakly perennial if it's if it's warm enough or it's protected, uh, protected enough over the winter time, um, it can come back. And it's very effective at smothering and crowding out weeds, but it's very slow, you know, right after planting. That initial startup um, is, is kind of problematic because you need to weed it for a little while, which is not a good trait for a cover crop. All right, that's the lab lab again, the, the vines, and then you can see the purple pots. And then there's a, there's a flower in the background of that other picture. Makuna prurians. Um, this was itching powder. Any of y'all old enough to remember itching powder? Somebody's smiling. You're smiling. You remember itching powder? I don't remember you put itching powder. Yeah, I think that was Porky's. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but I think that was Porky, Porky's. But anyway, um, there is a cultivar which is the utilis mucuna pruriens uh, var utilis that is not so pruritus and pruritus means itchy or causing inflammation. Uh, it was once widely used in the Southern United States, but it was supplanted by soybeans because soybeans were faster and they didn't cause itching problems. Uh, there's a related species, uh, Macuna bracteata is becoming more popular in tropical regions as used as cover crop and rubber plantations. It could be useful here for people uh, planting papaya. It's a, it's a serotonin fixer. They use it in a lot of medicinal. Yes, yes. And I didn't mention that because I'm trying not to do the, the, the herb, herb for health talk here today. I'm just trying to concentrate on the cover crops. All right. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's used as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a supplement. And its cousin, kudzu, is also used as a supplement, not for the serotonin, but to help with alcoholics. But y'all can invite me back to do an Herbs for Health talk and we can get into all the, all the medicinal uses of all this stuff. Um, Stylosanthes uh, guyanensis was another one that I outsourced to, the, uh, uh, to um, NRCS to grow for me. And he was looking at this plant because he said it might get rid of ticks. So that was what his research was about. That's why he was interested in this crop. Uh, it's native to Central and South America. It can grow over a meter tall, sometimes get up to 2.5 meters. It prefers open textured soils, no heavy clays. So y'all could use it if you admit it with enough organic matter. Uh, it's adaptable, however, from a pH of 4 to 8.3, which is why I left it in here for y'all because Y'all are about 7.8 to 8.2. This will grow for y'all. Just make sure that you have enough organic matter in the soil to get the drainage you need. Um, it's erect habit lends itself to multi-cropping with a scrambling type of legume to get even more nitrogen fixation. So like the, um, like the sun hemp, it grows tall and kind of narrow. It's not a suitable green manure for cotton. So if you're growing cotton, don't grow silo or stylosanthes because it is allelopathic on cotton. Remember I mentioned that allelopathy is very important when you're dealing with your cover crops because you've got to know if, is there going to be a problem later on. But not many of y'all are growing cotton, right? Nobody? Okay. You are? Okay. Well, don't grow stylosanthes as your cover crop for your cotton. All right. And that's, that's what it looks like. I've tried this a couple of times and it didn't do well for me, which is why I outsourced it. All right, uh, Vigna ungulata or cow peas. Mainly what we have here is iron and clay peas. Some people have started growing red rippers. I don't like red rippers, I like iron and clay, but there's a problem with the iron and clay peas that I've seen and the iron and clay peas that I was growing at Prairie View 
back in 2008, 2009, 2010 are not the same. I don't know. I don't know what to call it. They're not the they're they're not the same phenotype as the ones that they're selling now, because the ones that sell, they're selling now they don't vine as much. And so I talked to a uh, a cowpea breeder. Uh, I don't remember his name. I think it was Doctor Wheeler or some something like that. Uh, but this this guy was telling me the same thing that. These are the new iron and clays. They're not as vining as the old iron and clays. Uh, and he's got a, um, he's got a, a, a cultivar of, of really, really vining um, cow peas that, that he's putting out there in Georgia, I think. Um, don't quote me on any of that because my memory is like Swiss cheese. And I promise you can tell me your name and five minutes later, I will have forgotten you completely. So don't be offended. It's just that you're not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, plant <people>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, these, these um, fix about 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per year for the next crop. Uh, one to three tons of dry matter per acre per year. So like if you harvest it for hay. Uh, it tolerates very dry conditions, drought conditions. This can grow through it. Uh, they're excellent at weed suppression. They're great as a green manure crop. And as a fodder crop, they produce about 20 tons of fresh uh, material per acre. Excellent, excellent cover crop. Yes, sir. Can they be grazed as well as? Uh... Yes, that's why they're called cowpeas. Because in, in Africa, they grew them for cattle. All right, so this is what it looks like. Um, it fills the same niche in sub-Saharan Africa as our um, uh, faceolus type beans, our navy beans, pinto beans, filled in the Americas. But do, you, do you know what kind they're growing at some of the deer high fence deer operations? It's a type of pea, black, it's a black seeded, and they're using it for deer. Massive that is the that's the lab lab. That's a lab. lab. That's a lab lab. Lab lab, have, lab lab has a black seed with a white stripe. No, no stripe. No, nope. it's, it's just black. plain black. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to look at that. It might be a cowpea, but I'm, usually they're planting. Is it a big seed? No, little. It's a little it's tiny seed. Double the size of a of a okra seed. Double the size of an okra seed. Which makes it real little compared to regular pea. Like, a, yeah, I, I'm. I'll. I came across that at. Uh, but you didn't catch deer, the name. Deer hunting show down in, at, at San Antonio. They were selling twenty five pound bags of that. Stuff. And you don't remember the name of it. No. It might. It might still be a, a variety of lab lab. Elk mound. Elk mound. I don't know, forward it to us and we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. Um, so I did add some grasses in here for you grass people. Uh, one being sorghum Sudan grass. And that's because on the other side of the trials, see my side of the trial, I was looking at what weird thing can we grow that we can adapt to Texas. The other guys, they were growing the stuff that we knew would work in other places in Texas, but we're just trying to try it in different combinations and, and all that because we're trying to figure out mixes and rates and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't grow sorghum Sudan grass as part of my trials because I knew it worked. I've seen it work. Um, it's valued for, I mean, very valued for its rapid establishment. This stuff gets up and gets jumping really quickly. It's a nitrogen or other nutrient scavenger it's very effective of pulling everything that was left into the soil into creating more sorghum Sudan grass. Uh, this stuff was getting a, over eight feet tall in the field. It's huge. Its biomass potential is just enormous. Um, with that, four to eight tons of dry matter per acre. Um, 
and even even making silage of it was 12 to 15 tons um, per acre. One of the drawbacks uh, with sorghum Sudan, uh, sorghum Sudan grass or the uh, sorghum, uh, sorghum uh, genera is that they can form prussic acid when they're, when they're stressed. So that's when you go and look at, at Johnson grass and it's purple or maroon colored, it's full of prussic acid and it's not safe for your livestock to graze on it because that's a, cy a cyanogenic glycoside. It turns into cy a cyanide in the belly, in the gut. And that is, that is an evolutionary um, uh, uh, adaptation to prevent uh, stuff from eating it in its, in, in its most stressed time. It's, it's just in nature. So usually livestock can figure out not to eat the stuff when it's like that. But think about when Johnson grass is stressed, it's very droughty. There's nothing really to eat anyway because it's in the high point of the summer. So if you're, if you're a cow and you've got no other choice but to eat this highly cyanogenic uh, grass or nothing, you're gonna eat the cyanogen, uh, cyanogenic grass and you're gonna get poisoned and, and you know, maybe, maybe relieve your stress, relieve your suffering. In any case, uh, it's a very effective weed suppressor because it gets so tall that it shades out everything growing underneath it. That's what it looks like. Y'all know what it looks like. It looks like a weed, like a big grassy weed. Now, my favorite thing that came of this trial was Kajana's Kajan or the pigeon pea. Uh, pigeon pea is a widespread food crop in tropical areas. Uh, I went to India they're eating it over there. It's like one of their main staple foods and they had many varieties and I did not bring any back with me. I promise I did not st stick any seeds in my pockets and carry them on the aircraft and bring them back to the United States. I did not do that because that's not legal. In any case, um, it's a very strong nitrogen fixer. You can get about 250 pounds per acre, uh, 2.5 tons of dry matter per acre. So the problem with those dry tons of uh, Kajanus Kajan is that the, the stems get about that big around and it's very pithy material. So it's slow to break down and you need the right kind of equipment to mow it, to shatter the stems and break them into, uh, into um, you know, chunks. So you can get about 35 tons of, of fresh matter per acre uh, one of the benefits of it is the roots exude pisidic acid, which releases insoluble phosphate from the soil. So you can take your soil test and you can register that you've got phosphate in the soil, but your pH is not right for that phosphate to be released. Kajanus Kajan can come along and release the phosphate for you and incorporate it into itself and drop it into the leaves and make it available to the next crop. It is an absolute drought hero. It loves the drought. Nothing Texas threw at pigeon pea could stop it. Nothing. So that's, that's my favorite thing. I want something that you can fire and forget. You can plant it and come back later and it's done its job. That, that's what I was looking for and that's what I found in the pigeon pea. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this crop is so useful in many different ways. Not only as a cover crop because it's not its main use. Its main use is food. But as a cover crop, this is, this is the, the field in the background, all that green is pigeon pea. This is in the height of the summer down in South Texas. The only thing that's really growing, um, you can see in the foreground, a little bit of green, that is, um, why did I forget the name now? Um, I'm remembering one of you humans' names, and it's messing me from it's messing me up from <laughs> from remembering this weed. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's uh, I know it's useless too because you can make a poultice out of it and put it on ar ar arthritis. No, it's not plantain. Um, I'll remember it in a little bit. But anyway, that, that weed is very irritating down there and grows all over the place. Uh, the summer down there killed amaranth. It killed pigweed. Um, so it was very, very hot. Is that a research center or is that someone's private? This was a part of 
uh, plant uh, plantation pro produce farm. Um, we were doing research there uh, in their field. Now this is this is later on. You can see in the foreground all of the weeds are dead. Everything, everything is dead. Um, the trees in the background. The only reason they were alive is because there's a there's a, a creek back there, and there was a tiny bit of soil moisture down deeper in the profile, but everything was dead. Um, so they thought I was crazy because pigeon pea is one, like lab lab. You have to weed it um, for its first six to eight weeks of life. So I was out there in the South Texas heat with a hoe weeding an eight acre plot of pigeon peas. And they thought I was insane, but they came back later and saw the field and they were like, nothing else is alive anywhere that isn't irrigated. And, you know, I stopped weeding back in, what happened? So I, I took care of the field until it got tall enough to, to form a canopy where uh, it, it could defend itself and all that. It was about four feet tall. It was flowering. That was like the end of July. It was a happy little pigeon pea plot. I came back in October and the, the guy who sold me the seed told me it was going to get about four feet tall. It was going to flower. And it was a determinate variety. Okay, cool. It got four feet tall. It did what, it, what I expected it to. I didn't have to take care of it anymore. Fine. I come back in October and there had been a rain, uh, rain event. It had grown an additional two feet. It was still flowering and still putting out more pigeon pea pots. And the thing that I really liked is that everywhere else was like moonscape dry, but underneath the pigeon peas, the soil was still wet after that rain event weeks before. Remember I said that the organic matter protects the soil. So you have the canopy, which is the pigeon peas. And then when it, when it got dry and, and, and they stressed out a little bit, they dropped a bunch of leaves, which formed that debris. That debris then acted as a blanket to hold the soil moisture in place even weeks after everything else was dry and like rock, like a moonscape out there. When we walked out in the field, um, once you got under the canopy, the temperature dropped about 10 to 15 degrees. So people were really happy to get in, in the shade because like, like you can see on here, this is growing taller than me. And this is just on the side of the field. There was, a, there was a definite gradation on one side of the field where the wind hit the field and the other side of the field where it was more protected from the wind. It was much higher on the protected side. Um, we had a field day. The producers came out and they looked at it green and they looked around and saw everything was dead. The first thing they asked was, can I feed this to my cattle? Well, yes, yes, you can. It's a high protein fodder crop. Um, it's good for us. It's good for the livestock. It's medicinal. It's a cover crop. Uh, it's a soil conditioner, and it's just it's just great. They've been how am I doing on time? By the way, okay. Um, so pigeon peas have been domesticated for over three thousand years. Yes, ma'am. It does. It does all that. It's great. I'm telling y'all, it's the perfect crop. Uh, it. It accounts for about 5% of the total world legume production. Remember, most of it is grown in India. Um, and here's that graphic. It shows you cumulative, the cumulative percent share in India is, uh, um, you know, 70, 76% or whatever. Okay, so the average area harvested, uh, 3.6 million hectares. Harvested in India. The rest of the world, not so much, but in India, they, they grow a lot of it. They're eating the peas. They're eating the peas. In South America, they use it as a medicine. Like if your your uh, if your nose is all stuffy, you can eat the leaves and it'll it'll open up your nose. Much like Origeron. Do y'all have Origeron out here? Origeron. Okay, so the Origeron is like uh, it looks like chamomile. But it's not chamomile. You can chew. 
Again, I'm not treating, curing, or diagnosing any disease. I'm just telling you my experiences with these plants. So I go out and whenever my nose is stuffy, I go out in the, in the, in the field and pick an Origeron flower and chew it up and it just opens my nose up like, like nothing else. Um, so yeah, this is just a bunch of facts and figures and busyness and all that. Um, it's just showing that, uh, that you know, most pigeon peas are produced in India. Uh, and their yield is actually higher in Myanmar uh, than India. Um, and yeah, and they're using it as a medicine for diabetes and energy stimulant. It's good against food poisoning. Okay, somebody unplugged my computer earlier. I'm not gonna say any names, but um, anyway, uh, it's good against colic, constipation. So it's a it staunches blood, or it's a styptic herb. If you're familiar with that word, uh, it's an analgesic. It kills parasites. It's good for gingivitis, stomatitis, toothache. It's good against uh, oral ulcers and inflammation. And inflammation it nullifies uh, toxic intoxication. So does kudzu, by the way. That's why they use it for uh, alcoholics. Um, and it's applied over the breast to indu induce lactation. So lots of medicinal uses. It's drought tolerant. Y'all should all grow, go and grow it because it doesn't really care. But see the guy in the cowboy hat? He's the one who he was the one who uh, you know thought I was crazy. And he told the group such because I was out there in the heat, um, taking care of the pigeon peas. But once he saw how much they produced, he was like, okay, now I understand. This is during our field day. You know, folks are walking around. This is the windy side of the field. But once you get under the canopy, there's, I mean, you're under the canopy. And nothing, no weeds pretty much grew under this. In this picture, you can see one little amaranth. But in normal years, this whole field would be full of amaranth, of pigweed, uh, the amaranth, the pigweed, um, and uh, the sunflowers. Those would cover that field. And that other thing, Parthenium, that's its name. Parthenium. So uh, Parthenium would, would cover this field. That was the weed that I couldn't identify earlier. Well, I just I just forgot the name. I knew what it was. In any case, um, but yeah, so we grew the pigeon peas out there. Do you see any weeds? No, because the sunflowers, all that stuff got crushed out. Um, does it have pests? A few. Uh, if you look at this picture, This, the pod in the center has been hit by some sort of pod borer. So I'm still trying to adjust some things to see how I can get the optimal health to push the, the pests away. Something stressed these out, attracted a few pests here and there, and they're the same pests that make the, uh, the, the mesquite pods uh, inedible. Yes, sir? I was just wondering, how do you describe using tobacco? And, uh, no, because I, want, I, I look at pest control coming in at the beginning and not out at the end. So I'm, I'm all about prevention and I, I prevent by finding the right crop for the right environment. So there's something that is not quite right about the environment for the pigeon peas here. And so I've got to grow it in a bunch of different places and see where that I, ideal place is for the, the uh, pigeon peas. Yes, ma'am. See that wasn't that wasn't really the, the 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 scope of my work. I was looking for survivability and adaptability and that sort of thing. We're still here. Remember that publication I talked about? 
Cover crop options for hot and humid areas on the atro.ncat.org website. Oh, or just, just Google cover crop options for hot and humid areas. And then the presentation I did, I did, well, okay, so this presentation is like the new version. There's an old video version on YouTube of it where we hadn't done the research yet. I had just done like the literature review and all that that talks about these things. Um, but don't watch that video because you just got uh, the, the publication is what you want, and that's got the that's got the, the planting information and all this in much more detail. There's a few questions on the Zoom. Um, Mary Word asks, are these the same pigeon peas you can buy in the grocery store? And I actually did this myself. I think I was telling you the story at Topka, how I went to Fiesta, <laughs> and found some pigeon peas, and they were did, did they, they grew grow? into giants, uh, okay, so 12 feet tall. <laughs> the ones that Fiesta is selling, remember I said that those pigeon peas that I grew were determinate. Mm -hmm. So you grew the indeterminate pigeon peas. Mm -hmm. They turn into trees. I, that's the ones that I grew at first, and they got almost 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the frost came and killed them. Those are not the ones you want to grow simply because um, they're spending too much time in a vegetative stage, and they think that there's no winter. They grow like there's no tomorrow, like there's nothing going to come and kill them. Call, call the uh, uh, Arctic apocalypse snow again. So um, <laughs> you want the determinate varieties because they're going to grow in three months and provide you with everything you need. The other ones, they're uh, they're daily dependent, and so there's going to be some problems coming up. Now I did get some seed off of mine, from, mm -hmm. and I got this seed from Puerto Rico. On Etsy or something. Where can you get all the seeds? Uh, there are. Do you mind uh, seeds, talking closer to the mic? Can you can you come over here? Uh, to the oh. mic, so people at home can. <laughs> okay. There you go. She she asked about the seed sources, and uh, some of the good ones are Petra seeds and Hancock seeds, and you've just got to catch them when um, when they've got them because some people. Uh, there's some that they, they get some years and some years they don't have. Uh, other questions. Uh, a couple of soil builder mixes, buckwheat, crimson clover, and brown top millet. That's from Andrea Abel. Um, trying seed from green cover seed for the first time. Yeah. So I don't grow the mix. I don't grow mixes. NRCS recommends mixes. I don't. And I'm not fighting NRCS, it's just that I'm growing cover crops in conjunction with vegetable production. So I want something that's all going to mature at the same time and be at the same physiological stage at the same time. And when you're growing the mixes, they're all at different rates. And I don't want that. I want something that is clean and neat. I'm a Virgo. I'm, I'm, I'm very anal about certain things. And that's one of them. I want uniformity because I want to be able to, I want to get all the benefits I want at the same time and move on to the next thing. I don't want to deal with a bunch of chaos. So I don't use mixes. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's great for livestock production and for your fallow fields and, and that sort of thing. Let me see if I can find another question because I have no idea how to do this. This weird little laptop she's got. Would you, would you just make one question about I don't know how to make your thing move. So is there is there a way you can scroll it? Oh yeah. How did you just do this? So you just do it like you just go like. See, Mary Word agrees with me that Bermuda is the most hated weed. I love you, Mary. <laughs> I think that that was. Uh, do you need to inoculate bush and pole beans? That was another question. So uh, they're asking, do you need to inoculate bush and pole beans? I would. Um, a lot of them have been bred or selected against needing uh, so much uh, 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 rhizobium because you're, you're, you're fertilizing them in the, in the garden. And All thanks right. so much for coming. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for uh, zooming in. And thanks, Justin, for such a great presentation.
glad y'all liked it. We liked it. And now everybody's excited to swap plants. plants. <laughs> so good night, everybody on internet and on Zoom. Thank you for coming. Oh, good. Did you hear what the two sources were? Hancock seeds and what that was?